Good evening. Welcome to the Spiritual But Not Religious show. I'm your host, George Lewis. Ah, boy, we've been off for the summer. We've got a great fall lineup, some really, really neat authors right on the cutting edge of spiritual life. Uh, you want to be sure and, and, and check out our schedule. We'll be posting that very shortly. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Tom and I had, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, the summer summer went pretty quick, Tom. How about it? You uh, it go by faster. I didn't get nearly done what I wanted to get done. We've actually uh, moved our space uh, from our, the studio we were in, so the fireplace is now missing. Uh, <laughs> I've got that back for this winter so I can burn some logs, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my next week's guest is the founder of MatchMySpirit.com. So it's a... Uh, a dating site, a free dating site for uh, people who uh, like mine, like-minded uh, spiritual people. Uh, her name is Nani Nakagawa, and uh, should be a pretty interesting uh, evening with Nani. She's uh, a very interesting gal. Uh, tonight, my guest is uh, Julie Bon Genovese. Her her book is nothing short of joy. Uh, it's a good read and. Gee, it's really inspiring when you when you see all the all the the, the things that this uh, this young woman has gone through. Uh, I've got a little quick video that we're going to play for you, uh, where Julie is on stage with uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, and uh, her book actually is, uh, is is Dr. Bernie Siegel recommends it. Wayne Dyer, Alan Cohen, Christine Northrup. I mean, some really big names. It won the best. Books of 2010, ordered by the USA Book News, which is a pretty prestigious kind of a of a title. So, uh, Tom, if we're ready, play that video for us, if you would. back. I hope the, the volume was uh, loud enough on that where you were able to hear it. Uh, this is uh, Julie's book, Nothing Short of Joy. We have, uh, we have Julie on the, on the line, Tom. All right. Hey, Julie. 
Okay. Uh, boy, I tell you what, we've been waiting all summer, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. Did you have a good one? I had a had a had a a, a great uh, summer. It, it was uh, it, it was really short, however. Uh, oh, all right. How about yours? It was great. Yeah, it did feel a little short, but that's how it goes. Well, you know, short we, is good. Yeah. Wait. Well, uh, hey, listen, I. Tom, you need to mute that. We've got another computer over here that. Uh, there we go. Now, now we got it muted. So, had, had a little play. How's the video showing on her video? Is it? It's catching a little bit. You know, we've got a, we've got a, Julie, we've got a problem either with Skype or with the internet. Oh. And your video is like, I think it's you know very uh, jumpy. So we're only yeah. getting it apart. So we may end up just going to a photo. But we've got you live and well, and uh, that's great. So we're, okay. We're, I have been looking. You know, I've enjoyed your book. It's pretty, uh, pretty inspiring book. You know, uh, the, the thing that, that that came for me most from it was like, wow, what a tough life. <laughs> and and you know, I I also see how you've you know like risen above it and used it uh, in ways that are pretty spectacular from uh, from this viewpoint. Yeah, actually, I don't think it's rising above. I think it's it's because of the adversity. That's what presses us and and strips away the unnecessary and the masks and it that's what's making us real. That's what's calling us forward. So I don't think it isn't just despite the the difficulties, they're really the catalyst. I yeah, I think you're right. Did you read Scott Beck's book uh, or Scott Peck's book A Road Less Travel? A long time ago. Well, you know, the first sentence in the first chapter is "Life is difficult." <laughs> you know, and it's true. And I think I think you're absolutely 100 percent right. It's supposed to be because that what that's what sets our metal. That's what really, I think we need those adversities to take us uh, to the strength it's going to take to be maybe in the afterlife. This new the new vibration or whatever. Well, I think that yeah, life is a handicap for everyone, but. The, the blindfold that we wear or the body, the darkness, is purposeful because yeah. it's so amazing to climb out of that and then find out the whole time that our spirit was calling, that love and that joy was there quietly waiting because the, the climb up the mountain and the view from the top is so spectacular and it wouldn't be if we weren't challenged and we didn't hang out in that dark place initially. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, think, and I also think, you know, like from what it seemed to me as I read your book, that what happened for you is you finally got fed up and hit a bottom with all that stuff. I sure did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that bottom is really important in our spiritual life, our spiritual growth. Yeah, if, if we reach that saturation point and say, oh, I have totally had it, and start looking, and maybe that's the asking that happens. And then in that asking, there's a crack. For me, there was suddenly a crack in the armor, and yeah. there was a place where I began to be open to the idea that maybe I was shoveling some of the dirt on myself. Maybe I was the one bringing in the negativity instead of always the victim. You can only play that part so long. It's exhausting. It's not our true self. No, but I've, so, known, I've known people that took that right to their grave, too, so it's like... Yeah, I think there's probably learning in that as well. Yeah, as, yeah. As we leave and, and shed the body in that moment from that horrible place of misery, the ecstasy on the other side must be quadrupled. Well, you know, I think... The only thing I, I can it, think why that happens, that the soul has some idea that they're in for a tough ride. Yeah, well, I think, you know, Julie, I think what, what happened is you... And I have a certain amount of power in uh, learning to use it rightly. I think is is our job, and it, it takes it, you know it takes power to see. And if I'm seeing in the victim stance, that's how I'm using the power. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but if so, we didn't, go ahead. If we weren't in that victimhood, and and see how our own negativity is in the outside world that's projected back to us. If we didn't see that, we wouldn't know our power. 
Absolutely. Ultimately. Um, Absolutely. So I think there's a place for that. And, and maybe, like you said, some people never come to the other side, but they do when they go. So, so I, I, have, I have a suggestion. You, why don't we do this? Because I, I'm privy to have read your book and you're privy to knowing your story. But, <laughs> but a lot of our viewers aren't going to really know, you know, like get the full impact of this uh, conversation without right. you giving us uh, a quick synopsis of, uh, you know, a, sh a short version that, that takes us through and gives them some understanding of the challenges that you were born with and and give us a little a, a little brief idea of that if you I, yeah I, I, we sort of skipped right over that i was born with spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia which is just a ridiculously long latin label for uh, a type of dwarfism that's uh -huh. associated with degenerative arthritis well the dysplasia part of that uh julie my my dog has dysplasia in his hips yes and is it a sim is that similar kind of thing where there's an atrophy? Oh, spondylo is spine. Uh -huh. Epiphyses are the, the growing part of the bone. And dysplasia basically means that there's a problem in these areas. I got so you. So there's a problem in his hips. It's probably you know, orthopedic that he's rubbed away. And maybe it's genetic. Right. But he might have rubbed or she um, rubbed away that joint. So dysplasia is a really big term. But yeah, yes, it's, it's tough, too. Pardon? It's tough too. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I can I can see it him. I can just imagine what it's been for you. Well, and the beauty of of an animal having an issue like that, if there is a beauty, is that they accept it and and they live in the moment. Absolutely. And they don't dwell in the pain. And I think I've learned to do that as well. And how much recedes when we just surrender. And also use it as a metaphor. For me, all the issues I went through really reflected in how I saw myself and saw my life. And so eventually I was able to see the arthritis, see some of the big roadblocks as metaphors for what was in my own heart and mind. And as I started to soften that inside me, the outer symptoms were much, much better. Uh, it's been over 13 years that I was told I should have both shoulders replaced. I've right. had both hips replaced and both knees replaced and two mm -hmm. brain surgeries. And the shoulders, though, when they went, or my one shoulder, you had one I couldn't lock use up anymore for my art business, and it was really devastating right. because art had been the place that I'd always felt I had some value, and, and it was very comforting to me, too. It's one of those things where I, if I got involved, um, time flew, and all was well. It was that kind of uh, love. And so when I lost it because my right shoulder was so painful, I just I could not find a silver lining. I was so upset. I was thrown back into my past mantras about myself. I'm not good enough. I'll never measure up. Life is unfair. And then what happened, I started typing. My dad actually said, why don't you try computer graphics with your left hand? And I sort of begrudgingly said, all right, you know. Bought yourself a little MacBook, iMac, huh? I did, and I started typing. I never got to the computer graphics because I got so hooked on email and huh. that huh. instant connection with people, and I just started writing, 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 typing every day going back over these issues that I had haunted myself over for long enough. Like you said, I'd hit that bottom. And the final straw, the final catalyst, the inspiration, was the arthritis in my shoulder. The, the worst thing I thought that could happen besides my dwarfism. And so both, though, ended up being incredibly great teachers to teach me where my joy really lies inside me and not on these on my outside or in my circumstances or my body or the money I make or any of those things those are all secondary next to being in connection with my heart my truth my spirit right so that the arthritis leading me into that is always a good remembrance for me when something difficult happens to know that if we decide to find it, there's going to be something positive on the other side. 
Somewhere under the horse manure, there's a pony. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's, it's really an awfully lot, if not everything, is about viewpoint, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. It's t yeah. When I began to change my own perspective and realized I had a choice in how I'd been looking at things, in my 20s I found self-help books and books on spirituality, and I was just blown away. They all sort of had the same idea. Your truth is within you, and it's, it's blotted out by this perception outside of us by, from our teachers or our parents or life in general, and our choice of where to look, whether to listen to the outside opinions or listen within, is completely in our power. And they, they talked about oneness and authenticity and these words that I, I so wanted to understand and, and wanted to move toward, and I knew that the key was how I would perceive what had happened to me. Instead of what had happened to me, how did I react to it, and how did those reactions make them snowball into a, either a more negative place and then eventually a more positive place, depending on where you wear a path. Yeah, moving from a place of victimhood to a place of where you're actually picking up your power and using it. Yeah, and yes. realizing how many choices are out there how every many? day and how many choices or the choice we have in just what we're thinking in a day, what we're feeling. It's mind-boggling. It's fantastic. It's a huge responsibility, but it's so rewarding to you had, realize you, you that. You had quite a bit of therapy, too, didn't you? I did. <laughs> so so did, did, did the therapy actually turn that perception for you or was it just a piece in a process that was kind of unknown it just i mean the, funny i was just thinking about that yesterday my therapist who's become a great friend uh -huh. she's, she's very um she's open to so many tools and awareness that over the years she just keeps sort of adding to her repertoire because every person is unique every Circumstance is somewhat unique, even though it's all very universal themes. We don't seem to have any new brokenness around here, but right. each person reacts differently. And so she's always adding and adding. And I was just thinking yesterday, the pivotal point in my life, one of them was when I started reading the self-help books, but the other was really my therapy with her because she, she used uh, tapping, you know, EFT. Right, right. She used affirmations. Um, she responded to how I was working through something. She just, she was particularly, I think, amazing. And I made enormous progress in the first months that we were talking. Because it isn't just talking. It was, it was very... Um, yeah, it's an experience, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, very experiential. Yeah. And... I think that was huge for me because I had so, I didn't trust the world. I had backed away in many cases. And so for me to have to share with another human and trust her. And be vulnerable. That scary weakness that I thought was so awful, my humanness. I was so embarrassed and ashamed. And to share it with someone and have them receive it and love you anyway, and help you, and not flinch when you talk, you know, that was really big for me. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, especially after school, and all, and all that went on in your very young years there. I, get, I want to go back there with you, but before we do, I want to ask you about EFT. How did you respond to that? Was that, was that a positive thing for you? Did you get anything really from it, or how did that... I did. I felt like it strangely taps into your emotion, and yes. I was very anti my emotion. Absolutely, when I would yeah. cry, I would get angry at her, and because I didn't want the tears to come, and I, that was my defense right. over many years was anger instead of just allowing that flow. Something about the EMT breaks through that, because as soon as we'd start to tap, and she had my eyes closed, which was helpful to me, uh, so I yeah. didn't have to see her seeing me. She would close her eyes as well, and we would do the tapping, and sometimes though, I would feel a tissue in my hand because uh -huh. she, yeah. she could tell I was breaking down and in a good way, right. and it was really freeing. So, you know, it was a combination. It was her 
ability to hold that higher vision for me, but it was also, I believe, that tapping, something about it. I don't fully understand it, although she could give you a great explanation of the neural system and why right. that um, circuit needs to be uh, set right. Well, it's, but, like, it's a lot like acupuncture, isn't it, as far as opening yeah, up the... Yeah, and I think because we're actually doing it, we're the needles, but without the pinprick, right. um, I think that also somehow sets it into our nervous system in a new way and old habits, and she claims this for so many of her patients, that trauma moves out of their system much more quickly than traditional therapy. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are many, they're obviously great, uh, alternative methods out there. EFT is just one of them, and right. she employs a lot of great things. If you find a great person and you feel attuned with them, the work has begun. Ab- absolutely. Well, you know, I think it, 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 it really begins with your desire and willingness to make a change. Well, that's true. Yeah. Or your desperation. Like well, which, which causes that willingness, I think. You know, <laughs> right. It doesn't you know, matter what it is. Absolutely. Whatever sets that fire of flame right. is, is worth it. And, and, you know, I wanted to curse so many things that happened to me, and now I can't think of any that I, I can look at and say, why did that happen? Because all of them led me here in one way or another. So um, they, really, they look pretty... Special now. Let's take you back to, to your school days. Matter, matter of fact, you just uh, you just went back to your school, didn't you? And t- I did. T- 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 wow, July or something. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I bet that was quite an experience, wasn't it? It was. I tell was... us. Did you walk away after that feeling more empowered by that school than weakened the way you were in your? Oh, room? I sure did. Yes, and I was actually very nervous preparing to talk there. I had not spoken at a high school, so right. I was trying to figure out how to tailor my talk so that it could be helpful. Right. And the more I thought about it and realized that the biggest thing I wanted them to know was that everyone around them, whether they were the prom queen or the jock or the one who looked like they had it all, they were all worried, too, about whether they were enough. Right. And everyone reacts differently, and they may look confident, they may look happy, but a lot of us were acting back then. And so if they were in that boat feeling like they were never going to be enough and that these other people always would have it better, they were just so off base. And as I spoke, I remember looking out into the audience and everybody's face was really blank and looked terribly bored. And I had to kind of tell myself, oh, well, that's how we looked in high school. <laughs> Nobody wanted to show any emotion whatsoever. Right, the weakness. I got such wonderful feedback. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, I went to my 30th high school reunion and a woman came up to me, it was the wife of, of someone I'd gone to school with, and she said, I just wanted to tell you, when I went home last night, you were the subject of conversation. We, we had met the night before the reunion at a, a local place, you know, just as a, to see everybody more than just once. Right. And I'd met her briefly. And apparently she'd gone home, and somehow it had come up that I was there, and her daughter had been in the audience. Her daughter went to, goes to school at my old school. Uh-huh. And she said, you really affected her. She wouldn't go into detail, but she said that she completely connected to you, that she walked away feeling taller herself, and apparently she suffers from dyslexia. Uh So I had gotten a few comments like that. There were also a whole group of hearing impaired kids in, uh, in the audience, and when I saw them, I said, oh my gosh, I'm here for them. They must feel so marginalized because they're not mainstreamed into this school, which is very prestigious. They come in from far away, and they're not really accepted there, or according to my goddaughter who goes to the school. It's not that people are mean, but they just are isolated. Right. And so as I spoke, I kept thinking, it's for them, it's for them. And then, by great chance, I was walking through the hall, and I met the hearing impaired teacher and she said oh my goodness I wanted to come down but I had paperwork but when my students came back 
they said we really connected with her and they did this symbol. So I was so, so touched by that because I had felt this sudden, like, call that I could really speak to them and hopefully give them something to hold on to, that it was going to get better, that it wasn't always going to be this hard. Well, you know what, Julia? I think in doing that, you, you come as close and we come as close to actually changing the world as we will ever come. <laughs> you know, it's, it's when we affect young people and we change their perceptions and get them out of that fear and anger and fight mode, yeah. uh, the whole world changes. So tell us, about, go back and, and, and tell us about, you had one word really powerful. I related it to, you know, myself, and that is, tell us about the stare. <laughs> Very powerful word. There, yeah, most people understand that, Absolutely. which of course I didn't know growing up that everyone understands what it's like to be stared at and to wonder, oh, you know, is my fly down? Is my hair funny? Right. I thought it was me alone, that I was the only freak, weirdo that people stared at in my school. I was the only little person in my class, so the stare really was such a penetrating thing because in a child's mind or a young adult, the staring that got all my negative programming going. Right. You know, I told myself horror stories of what that meant, what they were saying. They didn't have to use words. And the times when people did, and I felt mortified and humiliated, then when someone stared, I thought they were thinking the same thing. Whereas maybe they were just thinking, huh, look at her. She's really little. Look at that, there's a fairy. I remember one little girl said, Mommy, there's an elf. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, um, you know, I could have been giving it a positive spin all those years had I had anyone to say that it's your choice how you interpret that stare. Because a shocking look doesn't have to be negative. And, and to shock people or astound people... That's okay. It's not a bad thing. You know, we're in a world uh, that's very reliant on image, and so difference is really can be really eye-opening in a great way so that we can broaden our idea, our definition of normal, instead of trying to crowd everybody into, you know, one set mold, which, of course, I desperately wanted to be. Isn't that the biggest problem, really, in the world is our unwillingness to accept all the, our huge differences. I mean, we have so much diversity in the world, and yet we want to pigeonhole ourselves. And, you know, if, if we're, we're dressed this way or we look this way or we believe this way or that way, we actually start wars around that kind of stuff. I know, I know. It's and insanity. the diversity is so fantastic. Well, Where without we... it, without it, it'd be, you know, no t no flavor to life whatsoever. I know, it's so boring. But that, and I wish that were taught in schools because it certainly isn't the, um, the overwhelming feeling in school is that you need to conform. And well, yeah, well, you know, I, uh, Julie, I think the, the, that adults tend to feel uh, very uh, threatened by diversity, especially around religious beliefs. Oh, yeah. Well, especially if we haven't moved past a lot of our wounds from the past. And then as adults, it's even more difficult to, to tap into that feeling of, ooh, I'm not enough or, hey, I'm different. And so, yeah, I think you're right that adults are more upset about it because they know inside that they are still concerned with other people's opinions. Not that I'm free of that either. I think well, we're, we're all. I think we're all conditioned, huh? Right, but if it's if it's really ruling you, then when someone else walks across your path who's breaking that rule, it's frightening. It's upsetting, and we want to, you know, blot it out and and run from it because it echoes that unbelievable fear of rejection, that human fear of not fitting in, of being kicked out of the pack for whatever reason. And it 
And if we don't deal with it, I think it gets stronger and stronger and stronger to where you have, you know, very, very cranky adults who are trying so hard to repress that fear that they're going to lash out at everyone else who might be triggering it, which, of course, and then it becomes a hair trigger because it's been there so long. And the sensitivity just increases and keeps increasing. Exactly. So, Which I think is just our soul saying, come on, come on. You can let it out. You can deal with it. But it's still our choice whether we want to or not. What, what's the name of your your website again, uh, Julie? Nothingshortofjoy.com. Nothing Nothing Short of Joy. Listen, you can get jo- uh, this book at Nothing Short of Joy. Uh, I really recommend that you go there and pick up a copy. Uh, it's on Amazon and all of your uh, better bookstores also. Uh, you know, one of the things, Julie, in reading this, you know, I saw, you know, it's a memoir, and we, we talk about, the, you know, the difficulties that you had and how you rose above it. But underlying all of this, what I really read was a spiritual journey. Yes, And the thing that you don't really go into is where has this spiritual journey taken you? What, yeah. What is your what is your belief system at this point? Where, yeah, where that's this... my next book. <laughs> uh uh-huh. Well, good. Let's talk about that a little bit. Not no, necessarily... I'm not. I can't say I'm writing it yet, but it's certainly in my I hear. my mind because. Well, that's writing it, isn't it? Isn't that where it all starts? Actually, does... that's the beginning. You're right. It's done. It's written. It's yeah. just not out on paper yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, when, when I wrote when I wrote my book, it was like it was in a gestation period while I was thinking about writing it. That was very much a part of the writing process for me. It is, yeah. yes. It's like before I give a talk, I am I'm going over it and over it before I even start to write to put down my outline. And really that's where so much of the information comes in. The meat of the book comes from there. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I, when my kids were, my son was... Uh, two or three, he was young, and uh, so I was spending a lot of time with him while my brain and my heart were on my book, so we'd be playing, but things would come to me, and memories and dialogue, and (laughs) all of it would come as I was with him, because I think in that state, you're in an open way, and so we're a better vessel for the information to return and be remembered so it's actually very it's like relaxation or meditation any of that is a is a great opening for what we need to know and then what we want to be a message of as well well yeah not just and for i don't know I, in reading your book i i could see this happening for you and i know it happened for me not only did the memory come back but also information that i hadn't been privy to anywhere it yes. was as though it came out of the cloud. And yeah, and I think it does. I yeah, think, I think it does, especially too. Especially as we become more clear about our path, and I know you feel on purpose with what you're doing in your life and yeah, your work. Absolutely. That that really opens up a, a channel to our higher self or our angels, whatever people believe, to the God we pray to. It's an opening. And... Things do surprise me as I'm writing, and I think, oh, where did that come from? So, and then yeah, I kind of feel like I know now that we've always been surrounded by our invisible friends and team, but it took the, the allowing it, the recognizing that something else was helping, something else was there was more than me involved, more than my small self or my personality. And that's exciting. Absolutely. Because, you know, I don't want to be alone on this journey, and I don't feel that way, the way I did growing up, so isolated and alone. I feel um, guided and surrounded now, and so... Well, you know, well, you, know you, use words, like, you use words around spirituality rather than... I, I noticed that you use universe as opposed to God sometimes, and mm-hmm. you know words that were are metaphysical. And so what I hear is a is a metaphysical bent a predilection in your spiritual life. Now, if if I, back in nineteen sixty nine and seventy I, is when I first started get into metaphysics, 
it was a pretty isolated path then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you were a pioneer, <clears throat> George. Well, I'm not sure I was a pioneer as much as, you know, I accidentally tripped upon it, or, you know, or it seems that way. I'm sure there's, I don't know. I'm sure I there's some, something in, in, in all of that, but, but it's really, really nice that there are more of us now, uh, a lot more. One of the things you talked about in the book, which I, I found pretty interesting, and I'm, I'm wondering what kind of resolution, if any, has happened. You, you had met Bill, and you were going to live together with Bill, and you were talking to your brother, Mm-hmm. Who had become a Catholic? Yeah. Yeah. What happened with that? Well, my brother's. Um, this is a sensitive subject because. Yeah. What well, do you know? What uh, this subject hits a lot of families. I know. You know, like some of my family are frightened to even talk about what I do. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Then we are on the same page. Um, yeah. Yeah. My brothers, who I love and I know, love me. And it's the reason they took the stance they did. Right. That uh, they were so frightened that I was going to marry, uh, well, at the time I was going to live with someone, but then ended up marrying a divorced Catholic. And in their mind, that was just, oh, they could not, they could not support my marriage. And I have not seen my oldest brother in um, probably 15 years. Uh, my other brother I have had contact with, uh-huh. and he still feels strongly that he cannot have his children around me um, because, I guess, I'm you know, such a horrible influence. Right. And they're frightened of me rubbing off or saying the wrong thing, I guess. I, we don't talk about it because it was such a big blow-up years ago. And today, I think my one brother and I trying to repair a relationship so that at least we're civil because we do love each other, but we don't talk about, we're so different, we come from such different ideas that I just send them love, I see them joyful, I, when I go to bed sometimes at night, I can remember the good times we had, and I try and focus on that because I think that's the energy that they'll feel in time and that someday if we ever can find common ground, I'm completely open to that, and I don't feel any hard feelings anymore. I did years ago when they sure. wouldn't you know, attend my wedding and they wouldn't have anything to do with me. I was so hurt, but... I realized I was I was accepting, I was believing what they said about me on some level, which was why I took it personally when it's not really personal. Their own fears about God and the devil are their belief system. It works for them for some reason, helps them feel safe and protected, and they wanted to protect me, and their actions were upsetting, but... They came from a, the place, the only place of love that they knew in that particular circumstance. Well, you so. know, I, 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 I totally understand that. But, you know, I see that playing out on a much larger field. You know, our country and maybe the world is really polarized along these very lines. Yes. And yeah. and do people who, you know, like, who, like you say, you know, they have these beliefs and they... You know, it seems like, you know, they want to protect you, but if they can't protect you, they'll almost kill you. <laughs> yeah, I know. And Ironic, it's not, right? Oh, but yeah. they're incredibly deep fear. Yeah, incredible. And, and it's, it, it, somehow or other, I think, uh, uh, if I don't believe the way they believe, they somehow or other, it threatens their belief in some fashion. I'm not sure exactly how that how that works. You know, that we're I guess we're a little afraid to stand alone, aren't we? Well, exactly, and we are triggering that that fear in them by being the opposite of what they need to believe. It's the same way that I trigger fear in others about their fear of not belonging and not fitting in. So along and along religious lines. Well, we really I mean, see that. Enormous. Yeah, we really see that in the extremities of the Christian and Muslim problem. That's in, it's a big problem in the world today. The extremes, yeah. and and I don't know where that's going to take us, but it's real, 
and and it really has its root right here in 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 what went on what, for you with your family. It's yeah. Power, yeah, it's powerful, and I don't know, you know, I I'm I'm quite sure that somehow or other in the whole scheme of things, it plays a, uh, it, it'll be like your uh, circumstances growing up with dwarfism, uh, and how it actually became an asset to you. Uh, somehow or other, in a, in a bigger picture, this all will probably play out that same way. But in the oh, middle it, of, and it already does yeah. because to have my own family and two brothers who I really admired and loved and looked up to, to be able to stand in my own truth and still love them. I didn't at first. I was very angry and very hurt. But to now have come to a place where I really feel compassion, I really feel open-hearted to them, that's very empowering. Yeah, it's and right it's, use of power, isn't it? Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's hard and to And it's do. really the only answer for me because I've seen both sides. The right. other side where I was fighting against them and judging them the way they judged me, well, what does that prove? And where does that really get us in a bigger picture like you're talking about if we can feel compassion um, feel tolerance and acceptance even for those who are completely intolerant we're sending out at least a message of love and a more empowering energy around that issue than saying oh they're horrible they do these awful things because then that just is that's just bringing us down to that level of fear. It perpetuates the whole thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, but the, the, but, the, but, the, but the difficulty, I think, in that lies in the difficulty that you had early on. How do we dialogue about this so that we can uh, come up away from that, uh, that place where, you know, we just, we can't, we, we hate each other? How, oh, with religion, do you mean? Well, I mean, with, with all of the, yeah, with all of this stuff. See, from because what what I saw in your story was, you mm-hmm. had all these people that you had some kind of an experience with, from the stare to the comments to the to all of those things, mm-hmm. that that had you at a place. Certainly, must have had you at a place where you know, bitterness and maybe even hatred, yeah, uh, and fear, to to where you know, like you're able to rise above that. And not play in it. Mm-hmm. And I think more of us need to do that on our own individual level in order yeah. to bring it out to the higher level. Yes. Well, it is. It's about the individual. Because when we start talking about changing the, only place the larger community and world, that's overwhelming. But yeah. from a standpoint of I can go inside and say, Am I believing what those people say about me? Is, do I have fear of being triggered by that? Always going within instead of saying, how can I change them, make them not be so intolerant, make them not hateful, not want to kill people. That's not where the change starts. It starts yeah. inside us where we don't have that knee-jerk reaction, that fear that someone else who doesn't believe what we believe might harm us. Instead, we come from a place of responsibility, the ability to respond with clarity, with, for instance, I think it was Marianne Williamson who said, you know, as we choose to shine, we allow others the permission to shine as well. That's the only place we come from is from an example, is staying in that love and compassion and not judging even when those others are looking intimidating or looking, you know, I learned that about bullies. The ones who looked the most powerful and scary were the ones who were the most scared. And they didn't need me responding in my own fear because then that draws them in. They see a target. Whereas if we are in a place of love and of connection, knowing that they are a mirror of something in us, something that needs healing, and then we go inside again and don't... it's. It's not about a conversation with them. Not at all. Feel it. Yeah, it's about that inner change, that that responsibility that we take to assume everything outside of us is a mirror of what we need to learn. An absolute mirror, a signpost, really. It says, hey, you know. A big billboard. Yeah, take care of this. Yeah. 
you know, the, the other thing is when you, when you start to get the idea that uh, I couldn't recognize in you what I don't have in me. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very powerful idea that takes a while to get a hold of. But Yeah, we, or I, I only see in you what's already in me. That, that's what it, exactly. So, yeah, if we see hatred and and negativity and depression in the world, and it's what we talk about, it's because it's in us. Can't, can't so, see it any other way. Yeah, yeah. we've got to resolve it within. You know, as soon as I began to even experience a tiny bit of peace inside myself, I, I felt I belonged. I felt there was a place for me. I didn't have that, that terrible defense need to protect myself. I saw it firsthand that that peace within really does represent a peace without. And so I get distracted as well, thinking, oh, I have to change that, I want to do that. And it's really going within. Because inside, when we plumb those depths, we are connecting to the whole. No matter how terrifying, no matter what killers, no matter what is out there, we are connecting to the universal oneness and, or God, or that place where... Everyone knows they are love and they are eternal and the fear isn't necessary. And the more often we can go there, I think the, the better we are that rippling that energy outward. Well, you know, one of the things I, have, uh, I grew to admire about you, and I could see it quite clearly, is I believe the, the real prize in all of this spiritual work and all this work that we do is coming to a place where we find peace of mind. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I had no clue for many years that that's really was where we were trying to go, was where we had peace of mind. You know, the other thing is that, uh, you know, more often than not, those who are victimized become victimizers. Yes. And to rise above that is very powerful. Um, yes, that's really the truth, because a victim, and when I felt I was a victim, I certainly... I didn't feel I had any power and so therefore wanted to judge others and, and put them down in my mind. Right. I didn't realize until years later after encounters with many bullies that I'd become a bully in my own head. I, I didn't outwardly criticize people. Right. Inwardly I did, and at times my own friends, I would, uh, you know, say something... Um, mean or to try and put them down because Absolutely. I was e jealous of them or I was feeling insecure or stressed at the moment and so that was hard to see that I'd become the person that I thought was so horrible and realize that it was just that knee-jerk reaction to feeling disempowered made me want to disempower others and, and of course it didn't help at all it made me feel worse so we can hopefully count on that, that somewhere, somehow, when we aren't acting from our spirit and we know it, we can feel it, it feels horrible, and we'll try to find a way to not keep repeating that pattern. So one of the things I also observed was it appears, and, uh, and I'm quite sure it's true, that, uh, you know, in writing this book and uh, openly 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 telling us you know your you know the darkness of where you were and the darkness of your thoughts and feelings really has put you in a place where you've met some pretty interesting people haven't you <laughs> how do you how, how did you come by being on stage with uh, Wayne Dyer how that uh, oh I love him <laughs> he's a hero for you isn't he he's a, oh he's totally a hero um I many, many years ago, used to listen to his tapes right. in my Walkman when I was afraid to just walk out the front door, to just go and do something scary like grocery shopping. I would put on my little headphones so that I could hear his comforting, wise voice, and I knew I was attempting to reprogram all my, my old lies about myself, and so his voice just became... A mentor to me and when I had my sons they heard him in the car we all knew his voice and he was the first one I thought of for an endorsement for my book 
uh-huh. even though he's he's probably the top guy in in that genre our self improvement. But um, I thought, well, I, I'm learning how to dream big, so I, I wrote him, and by some miracle, he was interested. Um, I sent him. I didn't even send him the edited version, I don't think, but I sent him the manuscript. Sent him the rough so draft, huh? Filled that just that had happened. And about a month later, my husband and my two boys and I were coming back from a birthday party, and a bill hit the, the play button on our machine, and out came Wayne Dyer's <laughs> voice. Uh-huh. My home phone. I nearly died. Actually, I started jumping up and down, and I don't really jump. You know, I have replacement (laughs) hips and knees. But I was jumping. I was wearing sandals, and I remember they were sort of thwacking against the the tile of our kitchen and making this thunderous applause. It was so perfect. And my kids were looking at me with wide eyes, and my husband was smiling. And I was just over the moon. And then he invited me to promote my book in Boston, which uh-huh. was which was ironic because Boston was the place that I used to go for genetic um, checkups, and it was absolutely traumatizing place for me. Uh, Boston was also the place where I found the little metaphysical bookstore where everything turned around. So I have this theme with Boston. I live in New Jersey. Right. So I ended up... Um, hauling my fresh-off-the-press books. Uh, actually, it was before the book had launched. My printer did them. My publisher uh, got the printer to do you know, a bunch of copies for this event. And I thought I'd be in the back of the room selling the book. Right. And then when I got there, his assistant said, oh, no, no, you're going you're to sit up front next to his daughter, Skye, who was going to be singing. And I thought, oh, well, okay. <laughs> then my friend Judy called me on my cell phone, who, she's a Hollywood actress, and I said, well, I'm not going to be in the back. They're going to sell the books. I'm sitting up front, and she said, oh, you have house seats? He's totally calling you on stage. And I said, what? What do you mean? Uh, I and didn't she said, tell you oh, that. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you have house, I think she called them house seats. And then when he came down the aisle, and I gave him a hug, and he said, um... I'm going to call you up on stage. Can you talk for a few minutes? And I I said, yes. And then immediately was thinking, oh, my gosh, what do I? I'd never spoken before a group, and this was a 1,000 people in this beautiful amphitheater. And I sat there with not knowing how long it would be till he called me. It was maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, and he called me up. I I managed to (laughs) speak out of... Some thoughts and walked away saying, oh, my gosh, I did it. I can't believe I did that without collapsing in front of an audience, which would have been my absolute terror growing up to be seen and judged and studied by a whole audience as I spoke without any notes or a speech prepared. So he really set me on a whole new speaking career because I otherwise maybe would have not known that I could had could do that. So I, his confidence in me, or maybe it was his the spirit of Wayne Dyer on stage that I my knees didn't buckle and I found things to say <laughs> that sort of made sense. Well, so that was just a thrill, thrill and a half. Well, and you I know the other the other part of that is you know we talk about his confidence in you. But what's interesting is is your confidence in yourself enough <laughs> well, to be able to ask him to be has begin grown. With. And and the fact that I said yes, my first instinct was, of course I can do that. Absolutely. <laughs> and my third, fourth, and fifth was like, oh. But yeah, I mean, I pushed through it. I was getting to that point of where yes was my first reaction instead of no way will I ever do that because someone could hurt me. Someone could re trigger all that pain I went through, I was starting to realize that pain had really been released, and I was moving into a new a new um, chapter in my life. How does your, 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 your newfound fame uh, play in your family life with Bill and with your children? Well, it's been 
busy at times and, and difficult to negotiate, but on the other hand, I feel so much more present with my kids when I'm with them, and I'm with them most of the time. I, I'm not traveling a right. lot. So, right. uh, but because I'm really following my heart's call and my spirit's path, I'm, I'm excited about life. I have exciting things coming up. I can talk to them about it. They know that what I'm doing makes me feel alive, and I want them to find something that does the same for them, that for them to reach for and bring out their strength and potential. So it's all wonderful. It's really, it's been a big learning curve, unexpected when the book first launched, the busyness. Right. And that was probably the hardest time because I, re- I did have interviews and, and appearances a lot. But it was very exciting. And strangely enough, my husband lost his job two weeks before my book launch, which oh, wow. which well normally would have paralyzed people, right? But I was thinking, awesome, I have the best babysitter Absolutely. for my kids. Because <laughs> <laughs> I would have been wondering, how am I going to handle uh, you know, leaving like at 6 a.m. on the bus, and how do I do? I have the babysitter sleep over. How do I? And I never had to go through that. Bill was home. He um, he was actually out of work a year and a half. Uh, but wow. recently, well, it's a long story, but found a new job. He works out of the house, which is just a dream. He's he's also in a new area, and so we're both in kind of this different chapter, and so we bounce that off of each other. Sometimes we're both stressed, and it's not easy, but a lot of the time he can really relate to what the newness that I face, and I can relate to his, and if I'd known that he would have been out of work all this time, I probably would have been frightened, but looking back on it, he really needed that time to reassess what he wanted. Right. and how he wanted to do his work in this world, and that he was done with the nose to the grindstone. Uh, I mean, it still happens. We all have that that imprinted in us, but he's learning that we want to create the reality that is um, healthy and nurturing and not that crazy rat race. Yeah, so it's yeah. working, and, that, it, and it worked, you know, on the heels of a big, a big loss, losing his job. But on the other hand, once again. One, one door closes, another opens, huh? Absolutely. I just got uh, my friend Tom just raised his uh, two fingers, which means we got about two minutes left. And uh, uh, this time has gone really quickly, Julia. It sure has. Are you kidding? Two minutes, Tom? Are you sure? Yeah, really. <laughs> it's like, oh, it can't have, can't have happened. So, uh, uh, you know, take a minute if you've got just anything that we've missed that you'd just like to blurt out and tell our audience that, uh, you know, you have something that uh, is uplifting, inspiring, or just anything that you'd like to say before we close out? Oh, well, you know what I have written on my, my dry board is affirm your dreams. Really, every day, as many times a day, to visualize what it is that would make you come alive and feel happy. My husband was in some ways forced to do that by losing his job, but by realizing what he did not want in a job, I was forced to do that by my dwarfism, by a lot of different things, to really claim what would work best, what would feel fantastic. You know, affirm that, think about it, make it real, feel what it would feel like, and and because it's working in my life, it's just amazing to me. It's wonderful. And, well, I, you know, what people don't see until it's happened for them is they can be mired in mud that seems like they can't get out of. And within an instant of a wink of the eye, they can be floating in a nice clear stream. <laughs> exactly. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Hey, listen, you were up there in New Jersey. How'd you fare with this hurricane and all the floods and stuff? Oh, my goodness. Well, we have a sump pump and it was going like wild, but we were not flooded. Oh, um, good. Cool. The yard was fine. We only lost power for three hours. I had friends who were out of power for five days. You, so, get, you, um, get, you get down here to Florida, uh, come when there's no hurricane, Julie, and uh, if you and your husband get here around Sarasota, give me a call. We'll have a cup of coffee or dinner or something. Oh, my uncle's in Sarasota. Oh, is I didn't that know right? That. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, that's right where we're at. 
Oh, well, I'll come see you, George and Tom. Do come see us, all right? <laughs> Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Thanks, Julie. You have a good night, huh? All right. Bye. Bye-bye. What a great gal, huh, Tom? Yes. Well, I just, I really had a good time with her, and she's just absolutely real. So listen, pick up her book, go to her website, Nothing Short of Joy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Be sure and come back next week. we got another great guest. I'm sure we'll have a good time. Uh, and in the meantime, don't forget to accentuate the positive and have a fantastic week. Pretty well. The doggone.